Messina Covers is not just any other case company. David Messina and Erica Howard design and produce some beautiful cases that fit both form and function. And you can choose your case design, fabric, and trim color, add custom engraving, and more. And of course, you can find out more at MessinaCovers.net. Peter Pickett and his crack team of craftspeople are continually innovating and providing the trumpet community with spectacular options for stock and custom mouthpieces. He and Eric Murine can help you find just the right size to fit your needs, and you should definitely consider trying the acrylic cup and rim. And if you're in the market for a custom trumpet, then Peter and Eric can build a Blackburn trumpet just for you. Check them out at picketblackburn.com. To stay current on what's going on with Studio HFL, you can follow me on social media on Facebook and Instagram. And you can watch the live and pre-recorded interviews on the YouTube channel. And while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. My first experience with a Hammond design mouthpiece has turned into a bit of obsession. There is something very comfortable about playing one of Carl's mouthpieces. The comfort, response, and sound are part of the HD experience. Try one of the stock mouthpieces or have Carl make you a custom one. Either way, everything is better in HD, and you can find out more at carlhammonddesign.com. If you're enjoying this podcast, I hope you are, I would love it if you would take just a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts to leave a star rating and a review. Doing so will help improve the visibility of this podcast and draw more listeners. When I first tried an Eastman B-flat trumpet, I was blown away by both the playability and the sound. And the more I found out about the company and got to know the people, I knew that this was a company I wanted to have a relationship with. There is a drive for excellence in design and production of every instrument, not just the high-end products. And the proof of this is that the one and only Doc Severinsen helped to design the Eastman beginner trumpet model. I still play that B-flat and have added a spectacular cornet and flugelhorn to my arsenal. You can find out more at eastmanwens.com. I'd love it if you'd visit the Studio HFL website and sign up for the weekly newsletter. And while you're there, you can also visit the merch page and buy a Studio HFL shirt for yourself and as a gift for someone else. Of course, you can do that at studiohfl.com. My current situation with my C trumpet is a bit ridiculous. My Shire C, which Samantha Lane helped me trial and choose, is the most versatile C I've ever played. The same goes for the new Destino designed by Doc. This horn sizzles when I need it to sizzle and is as smooth as silk when I wear my sil- uh, never mind. Uh, anyway, the line of Shire's trumpets includes the Q series, which are production models, and the custom series. Either way you go, you'll love the sound you get, and you'll also experience exceptional customer service. Find out more at seshires.com. Here's how you can access exclusive content like the interview excerpts. I'd like to invite you to become a part of the Studio HFL community by going to Patreon and choosing from one of the four tiers of support. You can help to financially support the show for as little as $36 a year. That's only $3 a month. Benefits include exclusive access to interview excerpts, a behind-the-scenes report, an invitation to be in the room with a guest during an interview, product discounts, and more. You can join the community of faithful supporters by visiting patreon.com slash studio HFL. Look! He's got a trumpet! Oh, it's so great seeing you. It's uh, it's taken us a little bit of time to get this this. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's nice that you're busy. Um, well, at least I hope it's nice that you're busy. Hopefully, you're not having to deal with uh, too much nonsense out there. But uh, well, yeah, it's the uh, uh, you know because you know I'm the vice president of musician union and right. yeah, so we're just trying to uh, trying to help our uh, our fellow musicians to get back work. You know, get back to work and. Uh, this uh, COVID thing, whoever thought that something like this would literally stop the music, you know? Just horrible. Just horrible. Have you ever, in your lifetime, have you ever experienced anything remotely close to this? No. I mean, you know, the thing is, is that in uh, 1980, there was a musician union strike uh, uh, that was against the uh, um, uh, motion pictures and, and television. And that kind of stopped things for a little bit, but it was funny because at that time, 
live TV was still going. So during the 80s, uh, when I first moved to town, I moved to town in 79, uh, 80, uh, there was a big motion picture strike. And so all those people who were doing movies and television, uh, uh, they were on strike for like almost, you know, it was a well over a year, year and a half. Oh. But music kept going on because live TV was still going. So we were doing, at the time I was doing the uh, uh, Cal Burnett show mm-hmm. and I was doing, uh, um, Marie Osmond had a summer show. And then the other guys, uh, they had uh, Barbara Mandel. Barbara Man- Mandrell had a TV show. So there was still some, you know, some musicians working, but nothing like this. This is, it's crazy. I mean, where right now, um, uh, for about the last five, six weeks, we've started some live scoring uh, for motion pictures and TVs at Fox, at Sony, uh, Warner Brothers, with some heavy-duty protocols, you know, where you show up at the session, uh, you uh, uh, have a temper check, they have a nurse there, they ask you a bunch of questions. As far as the stage itself, it's... Uh, uh, they're striping everything. In other words, the strings are going in at 10 o'clock and because the strings can wear masks and they can do one to a stand, right? And then at, let's say, uh, 5 o'clock, the woodwinds, the strings leave. They clean it all up and, you know, do whatever and sanitize it. And then the woodwinds come in and they'll separate them with enough. And then in the evening, the brass would come in and, uh, you know, all the social distance and the whole bit. And so at least some things are happening. But as far as um, concerts and things like that, they can't figure it out yet, you know? Yeah. It, it's so disappointing. Uh, my wife and uh, one of my young boys who plays violin, they, they participated in a driveway concert last night. Oh, you know? very cool. You know, and so uh, social distancing and everybody that showed up wore a mask. So we're sitting on the lawn, the front lawn of this lady's house and string quartets playing and Cool. And, you know, but a lot of people showed up for that. And I think it just shows that uh, Oh yeah, people want this. They Absolutely. This. I mean, they even have, uh, there, there's a, a drive-in in Ventura here that they, uh, you know, has been closed, but at least the things there, they open that up and actually have drive-in concerts, you know, with people sitting in their cars and looking at that. So yeah, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's pretty amazing. It really yeah. is. Yeah, but let's let's all get back to normal, please. Yeah, <laughs> Actually, please. I, I, even if it's not normal, let's all get back to work. Amen. Right? Amen. It works. It's yeah. yeah. It's uh, uh, it's it's for music to just stop. I mean, that's crazy. It's amazing. You know, uh, I've got a lot of. They blame us brass players, you know, because when we play, there's so many drop. Well, now they're finally starting to realize that's bullshit, you know? Right. Well, it's Which all I, optics, right? I mean, they, they, if they see a bell cover, then, then everything's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I talked to Wayne a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, and he had told oh, me cool. that you know, he had done one or two sessions, you know, finally back into it. But uh, he was telling me about the protocols. Yeah, it's, you know, and, but again, I think that we, we absolutely needed to do that to protect the guys, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, well, um, are you, are you still playing trumpet? No, actually for the last six years, I'm not allowed to because I am a, a title officer of the union. And so, you know, it was one of those things that, I've had that piece of metal on my lip for 57 years. I've done everything I ever dreamt of doing as a player. And so when I had the opportunity to become vice president, um, I kind of looked at it as uh, maybe chapter two of my musical career, you know, because I love the idea of being being able to talk to the younger musicians, to be able to, like every year, uh, every year I speak, well, up until this year, <laughs> I speak at 13 different colleges in the area, you know, to the, to the musicians. Uh, like I tell them what I do is I lie about my career and then I talk about the union, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, it's, it's one of those things that, um, yeah, I, I knew that I was going to have to uh, put my horn down. 
And so there's still pangs, but see, for me, I, I always hated practicing, but I was blessed because I worked all the time. But like, you know, for example, if I knew I had a couple, two days off coming up, um, what I would do, there's a really, really fine uh, female trumpet player in town, Glenda Smith. And I would call her up. I say, hey, Glenda, you got to beat me up. And what I would do is I would go over to her house and we would play two hours nonstop duets. I mean, you know, she, she was a Ray Crisera student, right? Yeah. And went to Georgia and she's a great player. But man, two hours of duets. And then when I walked out of there, I was ready for anything, you know? <laughs> and I just, to me, uh, the practicing part of it was never, um, uh, I just, I never, I never liked it because I didn't enjoy it. I knew it was still doing the, you know, you had to do this for the chops, but I was, I just took everything and I played everything. And um, I always knew that when you practice, you know, you do play a little different than when you're on the job, you know, which is true, as you know that, you know. And so it just, to me, it wasn't, I mean, I lived at the same house in Sunland for 30 years. I don't think my neighbors even heard me play once, you know, <laughs> at least out of the house, you know. Right. But, um, yeah, so so um, I had this opportunity. I was approached by uh, John Acosta to run for vice president of the uh, Local 47, the Musician Union. And at that time, it was also, we had just, uh, um, Dancing with the Stars went away. Why we did 17 seasons on that, and I, we loved that show so much. It was so great. They they treated us unbelievable. It was mm -hmm. two hours, actually four, almost four hours every week, live show, live to 20 million people. I mean, you know, it was an amazing band. They treated us amazing, and as I said, the eye candy wasn't too bad either, you know. <laughs> but uh, when that when when that went away, and they. Um, went to records and as we lovingly call it, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, oversized wedding band. But it's great because I'm so happy for Ray Chu and the guys, Javier Gonzalez, who is, who's, who's the first Trump player on the show. And it's, and it's a great, you know, the guys are doing great. I'm really proud of them, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then I was pretty much just uh, working um, uh, in the studios, which thank God I could say that, you know. But working with a lot of, you know, really um, not happy guys that, you know, they were worried, worried about losing work, you know, and all that. And I just thought, you know what, maybe I could do something good for them if I'm going to be the vice president. And, you know, I mean, the one thing I'm really proud of, most proud of is, uh, is that we, we are finally getting screen credits. Mm. Yeah, I noticed that. On, I can't remember the show, but. It was like, yeah, oh my well, gosh, I mean, there are names on there. Yeah, and it's, you know, and even though it goes by real quick, who cares? Oh, yeah, well, it's still very important, you know. Absolutely. And like, I, you know, I did 30 years as first trumpet on the Oscars. I mean, thank God for Facebook, because at least <laughs> Facebook, you can at least see the guys and we get out there. But, you know, there's names on. So when I became um, uh, vice president, uh, after doing 30, 30 years on the show and knowing a lot of people that, you know, so I contacted the executive, pro uh, the executive producer, Rob Payne, and it was three weeks, before, four weeks before the show was going to air. This is 19, uh, this is 2015 show. And uh, I said to him, I said, Rob, I went to his office and said, Rob, uh, what are the chances of the musicians and the music prep, you know, copies and things like, of getting their name on the crawl. I mean, you know, I've done it for 30 years and, you know, we're, we're unknown and you, I, and Rob, you know how important it is music. And he looked at me, he says, Rick, he says, there is names on the crawl that shouldn't be there. The musician should. And in front of me, he picked up the phone, called the Academy, and said, I'm sending over a list of 58 names, plus on top of that music prep, you know, orchestrators and copyists. And they did, and that was four years ago, and it's been every year they've had wow. the names on there. I feel great. And the other one is on the new contract that we just uh, 
start, uh, we just ratified uh, for motion picture and television starting in May, I think it was May, any new movies that come out, the musicians will be listed on there. And I'm Fantastic. so thrilled. Absolutely. Because you know, in the 80s, they always, they, you know, when we would ask for it, they would always say, well, you know, music is the last thing that goes on. And, uh, you know, and, and you already, we already have the crawl done and all that. But now they hit a button, right. you know, a hundred names, you know. And so it's, I'm just real, I feel real, real proud of that, you know, and that's cool. But, well, you know, you think about all those gaffers that get their name on there, right? And not to downplay yeah. the gaffer, but I mean. For me, for me, the one that always <laughs> bugged me the most in the 80s when I saw it, and I just, oh, it drove me nuts, is the honey wagon driver. Do you know what the honey wagon driver is? No, I didn't. That's the guy who drives the porta potty to the job. Now, <laughs> my, that's important, but is that more important than music? I don't know. Oh, my think gosh. So. You know, but he got his name on there every time, you know, the honey wagon driver. Wow. So I, what is it about trumpet players that, that we kind of gravitate towards, you know, being personnel managers or the <laughs> positions like yours? You know, it, it's, it, there's something in our mentality, right? In our DNA that seems to, to really care and want to do something. Well, I mean, I just think that... Being the trumpet player, uh, you know, because needless to say, we're the loud, you know, aside from maybe the drums, you know, we're the loudest person on that stand. And I think that comes out in our personalities and it comes out. Thing, uh, but I just feel that um, we are when we're sitting back there and we're playing, we're the leaders. We're the leader of that group, you know. And uh, we establish the phrasing, we establish, oh, we're going to breathe here, we're going to play this note long, short, this do. That's what we do. And so I just think after all the years of doing that and being involved, that it's, uh, uh, and I think we also found out on how to do it so that you're not being a dictator, you're not being somebody, it's like, wow, okay, cool, yeah, you know, let's, let's go that way. So I just... I, I, I think I think it's the 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 it's it's the 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 being the gregarious kind of people. You know, I have yet to meet meet a great trumpet player when you shake and say, "Oh hi, how you doing?" There's nobody. You know, there's I'm sorry. It's like, hey, what's happening? Come here, put you know, and they put their arms around you and big hug and all that. You know, I mean, I just think that it's. Um, it's part of us being on the instrument, playing that instrument, you know? I yeah. really do. Yeah. Well, so that makes me wonder, you know, back at the very beginning, was trumpet your first choice? Or did you start? Yeah, well, what happened very, at, at the very beginning, and I, I tell this story, and this is, and, I, and that's why I know that this is a God's gift. And that is that I was born with asthma, all right? And I still have asthma to this day. So when I was in fifth grade, I was running around the track at PE or whatever, you know, and my left lung collapsed. Anyway, they rushed me to the hospital. They were able to save part of the lung. The doctor, whose name is Dr. Feldman, God bless you, he said, take up, you need to take up a wind instrument to build up your lungs, right? And so, and I'll never forget that Sunday, uh, every Sunday we would watch the Ed Sullivan show. I'm sure you did, Ed, too, as a kid. And Harry James was on the Ed Sullivan show. Uh -huh. And I thought, wow, trumpet, that would be fun, right? And so at that time in the fifth grade, they had band class and you'd go pick it. And so I ran and grabbed the trumpet. And my folks, um, they rented a trumpet from the local San Lorenzo music store. And, and so they rented a trumpet and it came with three, three free lessons. And that was how I started playing trumpet. And it just, I, I think that it really, it came kind of, easy, natural kind of thing, you know. I've had great teachers throughout my life and, and you know, but it just, I always felt that it, it, it just came real natural, you know. Did you, did you notice a difference in your, in your breathing, your lung capacity, even oh, at that absolutely. age? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It was very, it was very obvious. I mean, because I really had bad asthma, you know. Mm -hmm. I could be the poster child for asthma playing trumpet, you know. <laughs> But, but your doc, um, but your doctor knew that you picked up trumpet, right? I mean, he, oh yeah, he no, it was yeah. it was on, it was at his suggestion. I take right. up some, 
asked him a wind instrument. He didn't say yeah. trumpet. He said a wind instrument, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so obviously, you know, uh, after when I finally realized that it was, uh, it was really helping, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, that was another benefit to being a trumpet player, you know. Right, right. So you mentioned, uh, uh, so I can't remember the name of the town you just mentioned where you where you grew up. Oh, San Lorenzo. I'm I'm from the Bay Area, up in. Uh, uh, yeah. So you're you're a California guy your whole life, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah. So you went to school there. You you spent your yeah went to uh, yeah. Uh, went to uh, went to a Royal High School, and was uh, you know in the band and uh, and for me my teacher I had I had a, a great trumpet teacher in Oakland. Uh, his name was Leo Jameers, and he pretty much started me, he wanted me to be a legit player, all right? So when he started my lessons, I mean, he started, he, he, he would, uh, in fact, I still have the old lesson book uh, that he signed, a little blue thing, that it was $3 a week. I mean, that was written on there, <laughs> you know? And uh, so he would, he would start me on the Arbin's book, uh, and he says, okay, now we're going to do it in A trumpet, then we're going to do in C trumpet, another trans transposition. So yeah. transpose C trumpet and go all the way up C, D, E flat, and F trumpet on all different exercises. So he was really kind of grooming me to be a legit player. And I did. And I was subbing in the San Francisco Symphony at 14 years old. Oh, my gosh. Subbing in the Oakland, in the Oakland Symphony, you know. And doing all the anything, the Holy Name Symphony, there was a symphony at a, at a school that I would play. I mean, anything. I literally took, and I tell this to these young players, is that, you know, I love playing so much. I took every job, you know, from, from Chinese funerals to Portuguese Holy Ghost parades. I was in the original Raider band. I was I played in the San Francisco 49ers band. I played you know, the circuses. I mean, I did anything in, the, in San Leandro in the Bay Area. They had a, a municipal band that played every weekend. I was in that. I just wanted to play my horn. That was it, you know. And so um, in high school, uh, in my sophomore year, we got a stage band. And all of a sudden, I started, you know, I, again, I had my, my binge with the, my, my binge 5X with the 5X, uh, fi with a huge uh, 1C mouthpiece, right? <laughs> and so I, then it was, I realized, whoa, this is way too, you know, to play this kind of music. So I started listening to all the big bands, you know, and Woody Herman's. I love Woody Herman's band. And, and, and of course, Buddy Rich. And listen to Maynard and all that. And so then I started to get away. I realized because being the young guy in the, in the section in a, in a major or in, a, in an orchestra, uh, when there was a piano concerto, I was the one that got stuck counting. Okay, you got to count up two hundred bars rest, and they go and then count another hundred bars rest. So right. I mean, I I wanted you know, I really loved playing in Basie's band, and I'm I was. I didn't know who Snooky one Snooky Young was, but man, we ended up being great, great friends in LA. Mm. But just to listen, listen him play, right? That that was that was that was the greatest, you know. Uh, but growing up in San Francisco, there was a lot of opportunities, which was really good. So I, I you know, I went to college for about a month. No, I guess it was. <laughs> It wasn't, you know, because I knew that that's not what I wanted to do, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I was playing. So this is so uh, I was born in 1948. OK, this is 1968. I was playing in a club uh, downtown in San Francisco called Mr. D's. And it was uh, they would bring in uh, they would bring in uh, stars. So it was like a Vegas kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And so Bobby Darren came in for a week. And uh, his conductor was uh, Bob Rosario. And I was playing in that band. And Bobby really loved my trumpet playing, right? So his conductor, Bob Rosario, came to me. He says, hey, Rick, he says, Bobby is going to be going to Harris, Reno, the end of November, and uh, for two weeks. And he wants you to come as his first trumpet player. And I said, yeah, okay. So I lied about my age because I was only 20, right? Lied about my age, said I was 21 years old. And I went up there with him and um, played Harris Reno for two weeks with Bobby Darren. 
And the conductor there, George Hernandez, who's the band leader, liked my playing. And the guy playing, uh, playing in the section was the great George Graham. And George, we ended up being great friends and all of that. So George, uh, so they offered me the job to be in the house band. And that was the best. Because I always, what I always, growing up, I knew that I wanted to come to Los Angeles. Never had any eyes to go to New York. But I knew that L.A. was the place where all these great shows were growing up watching, you know, the all the all the all the great live TV shows, Sonny and Cher, and and all those, and the Oscars, of course. I always said one day I'm going to play the Oscars, you know. And so, by going to Reno, I knew that I needed to get more experience. I was still just a 20 year old kid, you know. And so I was up there. I was up there for two years. And then um, had an opportunity to go to Las Vegas. And I worked in Las Vegas from 1971 until 1979. I had the greatest gig in Las Vegas, where at that time in Las Vegas, there was 11 house bands that had full orchestras, all the trumpets, trombones, saxes, strings, everything. Well, the stars would come in and they would work seven days a week, but the, house, the guys in the house bands could only work six. So on the seventh day, they had a relief band. Mm -hmm. So I was the lead trumpet on the relief band for about seven and a half, eight years. Uh, so we would work six different hotels every week. And it was a great gig. You know, I mean, you would just, <laughs> it was just such a good band, sight reading. You could sight read anything, played every act. But what that did for me was it afforded me an opportunity to have a peop a people like Nelson Riddle and Peter Matz and all, cause they would come in with the different acts and they would hear me play, you know? And so that was another kind of gateway for me to come to Los Angeles, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I always feel bad for some of the younger guys that they don't have that kind of proving ground, you know? Um, I had opportunities to play with different on the road with different big bands, uh, but never, I, it never made sense to me. I was, I had this great job, you know, six days a week in Reno and then Vegas. And I always knew that this is where I wanted to be was in Los Angeles. So what do you think it was about your playing that, that drew the attention of these band leaders and artists we, you know is it the high chops i doubt it i mean it, it had to be the sound you know, the phrasing, I, I right? Think, i think yeah i mean for me it was i think truthfully was what mr demir's uh, instilled in my mind was that you always hear you every note you play you have to listen and make sure it's right and so on the relief band like i said we would play six to eight different hotels a week and I, for myself, I made, I made a pact with myself that every time I pick up my horn, I'm not going to make a mistake. Now, of course, that's not true. But in my mind, that made me listen to everything I played. So I really was very, very conscious about playing everything exactly right and playing it good, you know. And I just... And I always said that you could learn from anybody that you sit with, you know, yeah. uh, 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 and that's what a lot of times, you know, and you don't want to copy their playing, but wow, I like the way he did that. Boom, you file that, you know, or uh, uh, I remember um, Maynard's one of his things that, you know, at the end of at the end of a, a, a at the end of a chart, he would do a thing, you know, that kind of thing. And just like a rip off kind of thing, you right. know, and, or, or the shakes with the shakes, you know, and then, and Snooki is the one that told me this too. Most guys, when they see a shake on top of the note, you know, you know, big band players or whatever, mm -hmm. they, they hit the note and immediately start shaking it. No, you establish the note, you establish the sound and then do a shake. And so when I tell this to the younger kids who are watching, I says, okay, example, um, when you watch the Family Guy TV show and listen to the main title, all right, 
So Walter Murphy wrote that main title and he, I get this phone call, it was at home, he says, hey Rick, he says, come on over to the studio, uh, there's this new cartoon show and we want, we're going to do the main title. So he called myself to play all four trumpet parts. Mm -hmm. Alan Kaplan did all four trombones. Dan Hagen played all the saxes, right? So when you listen to that main title, and I've, I've explained this to a lot of guys, mm -hmm. there's, a th there's a thing where there's some shakes in there, right? And when you listen to the shakes, all the shakes, they said, yeah, it sounds like all of them are exactly the same. Well, I said, well, yeah, of course. I played all four trumpet parts. So <laughs> laid the four trumpet part down, you know. And then so when you hear the shake, we all shake exactly the same, you know. But just little things like that, I think, is really important. I also loved um, being the first trumpet. You play the music that the composer wrote or whoever wrote the best you can. But I always tried to add a little of my personality mm -hmm. into the music, you know, maybe do a little gliss up into a note or, you know, I was never one that, you know, hang over, you know, I, I, I really never liked that hanging over two or three beats. That was not cool. Gazo used to hang, they used to call it a Gazo eighth note. And he would hang over just a little bit you know, just to say, yeah, that's me, you know. And so, <laughs> so I, so I really tried to put some of my personality into the music. And, and then, uh, like, especially on, on movies, the one that I, uh, the, the, the movie, like I've done 1300 motion pictures, okay, Jeez. which I'm thrilled to say. Yeah. Uh, but the one that I get the most credit for is uh, the movie The Incredibles, mm -hmm. the original Incredibles. And because when you bought the DVD, there was a scene that uh, uh, you could go to music, right? And you, you go to that and uh, uh, it shows us playing. And as you say, you know, I love talking. So the guy came over with the microphone, you know. But yes, yeah, so I, you know, right now on, on Facebook, I still get from musicians around the world, literally. Just recently, there was this young kid in uh, South Africa, Bo uh, and he's a trumpet player, and you know, Mr. Baptist, you're my favorite trumpet player because you played on my favorite movie, uh, The Incredibles, Can I Be a Friend? So I thought that that was kind of cool, you know? <laughs> And so, but on that movie, it was really, you know, Michael Giacchino, that was his first big, yeah. big movie, all right? So I'm there, I was playing first, Wayne was on second, Wayne Bergeron, we had uh, uh, Paul Salvo and uh, Jeff Bennell were the trumpets, right? And the music, obviously, was very, very important, right? And so... Uh, there was just one scene, and this is this is an example of what I I I like doing as a first player, as a as a player to put my personality in the music. Uh, there was a, 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 a there's a, there's a young group of um, uh, four trumpet players out of Utah called the Brunson Brothers. Okay, okay, yeah. So we used to they would come down and we would do shows downtown, and then they would be out after the show and entertaining the people, you know, the case open, they'll make a couple bucks, it was cool, right? But their whole thing was, uh, they were like Maynard, uh, you know, Maynard, they're, you know, they, they idolized Maynard Ferguson and everything he did. So when they would play, they would play like, you know, some really exciting stuff. It was a, a lot like Chase, you know, and all that. Mm -hmm. And they would play for the people, you know, but their thing that they did the whole time was like, they would play da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 yeah. And they always do that at the end of the thing. So they were on a they were on a telethon, uh, Easter Seals telethon, and I was there with Chuck Finley, and uh, I try, I'm trying to think Frank Zabo and myself. And so they played, and then for the rest of the telethon, we all three would do that on any cue we would play. Oh, no. It was great. <laughs> so anyway, so we're doing uh, Incredibles now. When you do the motion pictures they actually, there's a screen behind us, a huge screen. So we can see the scene that we're playing to, right? And so at one point, and everybody knew, we call it a Brunson, right? Everybody knew that, you know. And so I was watching the screen and Michael Giacchino, and it, and it was a scene where they were running up this top of the hill and they got to the top of this hill and the music, and we're playing, you know, 
and 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 they got to the top of the hill and one of the characters kind of went like that like just you know and michael i felt didn't catch it in the music right and so um, we played it and he was very good about allowing us to make suggestions and i raised my hand hey you know michael um uh, would you mind if we just do one more and I wanted to add something? And he was used to me doing that. So he said, yeah, go for it. So I told the guys, okay, guys, uh, at the end of this, at the end of this thing, and then we'll do a Brunson, right? So all four of us. And so it was perfect. You looked around, and as the guy moved like this, we all went, ah, right? We all caught it. Well, it was hysterical. We looked in the booth because you could see the booth. They're high fiber. Yeah, that was great. You know, so for me, that was the fun stuff to do. You know, right. right. And like, if you have a, 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 a first note of a chart is a high D, we'll say, or something. You know, I would always just add a little, yeah, just a little inflection into it. Yeah. And so. You know, as long as, you know, I, you know, maybe I'm batting average about, you know, 900, I think, you know, there's one times when they said, oh, no, we don't want that, you know, but again, it's just, I like doing that. To me, that is the exciting part about being playing, you know, that's what I didn't like about the legit stuff, because you couldn't do that, you right. know. Well, this is style, right? I mean, this is this is what I'm style. trying to work with my student students about is like just because it doesn't say it on the page doesn't mean you're supposed to just play it completely unaffected, right? I mean, you got to right. find you got to right. find something to make it interesting. And, and, exactly, you know, and yeah. to play stuff up an octave and all, you know. I mean, again, it's and I learned this over the years. Believe me, that you know when when you take everything up an octave. At the end, it just, it doesn't sound, it doesn't add anything to the thing. Right. You know, whereas if you're going to do something and play it APA or, you know, you know, do it where it means it's something, you know, and just yeah. doing, just don't do it just to, to look like, hey, look at me, I could play that, you know. I mean, yeah. uh, the greatest uh, uh, studio trumpet players, uh, uh, such as uh, Conrad Gazzo, I mean, one of the greatest. He would never play anything above a G, a high G. He said, no, call Bud Brisboy. You know, but that high G was this big. And it right. was the same thing with John Odino, who was first trumpet player on the uh, Johnny Carson show for all those years. Yeah. John never played above a G. Not that he couldn't, but it's just, you know. And for me, uh, my top, uh, uh, I mean, I could, I could count on a high, on my Shilke, I love my Shilkies. You know, I played the Shilky B5 for uh, uh, a lot of years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for me, the high A, third valve, high A, mm -hmm. was there was a huge slot there, and that was the tops. I would not play above a high A, although yeah. uh, I did have to play a double C once, and that was Bill Conti. It was on the Oscars. He was trying to bust my balls. And so he wrote a thing that went up and he wanted, uh, it went up to double C, you know. And I, and I looked at him because I knew that he was just doing it just a mess. With me, you know? <laughs> and so I said, okay, I'll give it to you one time. And so we I rolled the tape and I got lucky and played it. But that's the only time. I mean, I, when I tell some of these young guys, you know, it is great to have those notes in your pocket. But truthfully, the money notes, right. the notes where you're going to make the most money as a lead trumpet player are the high D, the E flat, E, and an F. You have those notes. If you could play those anytime and not miss them and play with a big sound and all that, you're going to make a hell of a lot of money as right. a trumpet player. Yeah, I remember somebody told me, you know, there's the low register, there's the high register, and then there's the cash register, right? I mean, that's exactly that's, what you're that's, talking about. You yeah. That's great. Yeah. I love that. That's good. I like yeah. that. Yeah. But that's so, true. Uh, you know? uh, I, I want to know what it was like. You're out in Reno. And was it from there that you got that call to go to L.A.? Or, or how did you get to L.A.? Did you go like? What, what, the way I got, I actually, I went to Vegas first. 
And uh, so again, I was working, making you know, a lot of money in Vegas and all that and had a family, but my heart was always going to Vegas. So what I did was about the last, uh, the last year and a half uh, in, in, in Vegas, uh, when uh, uh, like uh, Peter Max came into town, uh, Nelson Riddle, uh, Lenny Stack, all these guys that I knew were either band leaders, you know, and, 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 and hired people. I would say to them, hey, I'm really thinking about coming to town. Can I call you? That's all, you know, and so I did when I when I finally uh, uh, severed the ties of the, to Vegas and I moved, I called I called Peter Matz. He was the first one I called and his contractor, Joe Saldo. And uh, I said, hey, Peter, you know, this is Rick Baptist and and I'm uh, I just moved to a town and I would, you know, like, well, the next week I get a call to do the last season of the Carol Burnett show because Peter was doing that. So I immediately started working. Same thing with Nelson Riddle, you know. Uh, I just, uh, 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 because they heard me play, I was a proven player in Vegas, and, you know, they added me to their list. You know, I wasn't expecting, and I was hoping that I was not bumping somebody off, but that happens sometimes, but not because I was, um, pressuring them to do that no they found a place for me to right. play and so that's how i ended up getting to vegas i mean getting to la and that was my start of uh, 40 years in the studios there you know do you remember your first scoring session uh the first big scoring session was uh it was actually uh, a, a helen reddy god bless her she just passed recently it was a helen red tv special and it was Lenny Stack was the conductor and the other trumpets because I traveled, uh, I did some, uh, some small band gigs with Helen along with Tom Kubis, we would travel with her. Mm. And so uh, she recommended I do the TV special, right? Well, in the, tr in the trumpet section, it was, I was in heaven, John Odino and Bobby Bryant. And there I'm sitting there. And those guys were the greatest guys to a young guy, you know, a new guy in town. Uh, they treated me amazing. And that was something that I always remembered the rest of my life was that they were so encouraging and so nice. And that's something that I hope that any, any young player that I work with will say the same thing about me because mm -hmm. that's, you know, they could have, you know, if they were worried about their job, if you're, you know, this new guy, we're going to, they could have buried me. They could have made me look horrible because I didn't know what I was doing, you know, but they just kind of put their arms around me, both of them. It was amazing. And, uh, but that was the first gig that I do remember. I mean, like, you know, again, as far as movies, the fifth movies I did, fifth movie I did when I came to town was E.T. How yeah. crazy that you know <laughs> and so you know but it was um, uh, um i think the most important thing and and when i explained and talked to these younger kids because a lot of them you know especially in college um they were probably the best player in their high school but now they're in a college they're in a where all these other players are you might not be the best player but what you need to do is you play the best you can. You you try to be one of the guys. You, every day when I when I tell you know guys you're gonna walk into a session, you might not be the first player. So you be the best second, third, or fourth trumpet player you can. You support that lead player because they'll remember that. They'll remember that you know. But if you sit there and you try to show them up or do that. You know, it's, I'm sorry, it's a team thing. You got to, you got to, uh, you know, I, what I tell them is you check your ego at the door when you walk into wherever you are. And if you're not the first trumpet player, that's okay. The music is the important thing. That's the thing to play right and play it the best you can. And I tell them that no matter what job you're on, you never know who's going to be in the audience to hear you play. Yeah. Aside from the other players in the band, wow, we heard this young guy. So <clears throat> you just 
you, you, you know, we all have an ego. Again, like I said, I have yet to meet a great trumpet player who will go, oh, hi, real shy. No, you play your personality, right. but you've got to check your ego. Um, I've gotten more jobs uh, by uh, just being a good guy and, be, and having fun, because it's fun. My God, we're doing something that we love doing and we get paid right. for it. How cool is that? You know, mm -hmm. have you ever witnessed though? You're talking about uh, somebody coming in and, and trying to show off absolutely. and absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's and it's and it's no names, but I've I've seen you know I've seen guys trying to sabotage other players, mm -hmm. you know, because hey, well, why is he there? I should be there. You know, again, that's. The ego is, is, is something that will always come back and bite you in the ass, you know. But yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, it was really brutal, like playing, playing real out on the under parts, push in a little bit, maybe, pull out a little bit, a little out of tune. Right. I was saying, we've all been in that situation. That's the worst thing for your child, right. you know. Or I'll sit there and actually play higher than the other player. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Right. We're all there for one thing. That is to play the music and to get a paycheck at the end, you know. Yeah. I'm just thinking about sitting, uh, sitting down in some of these scoring sessions. I mean, you sit down to play E.T. Great score, right? One of his oh, best. Amazing. And the tunes, you know, I still listen to, to that. I've got that on my phone. I still got that soundtrack on there. It's beautiful. Yeah. But there have to have been some sessions where you're playing and you're like, oh, man, this is awful. <laughs> I mean, it, that, is, that happened? And again, you don't have to name names, but I'm just kind of curious if you mean ever... You mean as far as the music is awful or the other yeah. playing? Is... No, the music. Oh, yeah. Well, then, then again, I, I, I take that as a challenge to try to make it better. Mm -hmm. I mean, again... Uh, 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 there's just been, you know, just little things that I think we do. The story I enjoy tell is the movie Up, right? Everybody's oh, seen yeah. that movie. It's a beautiful Pixar movie. I'm so thrilled to say I played on the first 14 Pixar movies, every one of them, right? Wow. But on Up, Michael Giacchino, again, Michael Giacchino, uh, was, the, was the leader, and we were doing it, and uh, in that movie, there's tons, I have tons of trumpet solos, all right? And Michael actually wrote it to be played in a straight mute. Mm -hmm. And when, so when I played it, I just felt that the straight mute was not, it was just too tinny sounding. So again, I just, you know, so there's 75 musicians there, come on, you know? And so uh, I have this, uh, the, you know, this recurring solo through the whole thing. And I have an old 1938 solo tone that was given to me by Manny Klein, right? And it's just, and the solo tone is such a nice, a warm kind of sound, right? There you go. There it is. <laughs> I actually have it you out know? for a gig coming up. Yeah. Right. And, and so, uh, so we, we played this cue and I, again, raised my hand and the conductor was Tim Simon. I guess this, uh, Tim, I said, can we do one more? And Michael says, why do you want to do one more? I said, yeah, I would like to try some. And they all knew, you know, the whole orchestra. Was like, oh, geez. So anyway, <laughs> I put the solo tone mute and played it again. They start the tape. And at the end of the cue, red light went off. And I see Michael and Pete Doctor, who was the director and mover, get out of the booth and they walk their way through the orchestra and walk and each came to each side of me and kissed me on each side of the <laughs> cheek and said, that's the sound we were looking for. So for me, if, if something is, you know, written not well, it could be, you know, I mean, a lot of times they don't know how to write for different it's you know for brass you know and so which is why all of us i mean i worked with the same five or six musicians for 30 trumpet players for 30 years right now the great brilliant malcolm mcmahon the unbelievable most uh, uh i think the greatest all-around trumpet player ever warren looney right uh john lewis who's now the number one guy and all these guys and then wayne came in at the end you know we all bring four to five trumpets to the session. 
for two reasons. One is uh, a lot of times the composer, they write stuff that's off the horn, either too high, too low, you know. And so the reason I think that we were the chosen, I guess, to play on all these things was because we always played everything. Now, Malcolm, if he was a first tournament player, I was playing second, Warren was playing third, or whatever. And if a big band chart came up, boom, it was on my chat. Malcolm could have done it, but he knew that was my bag and I would do it. Same thing for me. If I was playing first trumpet player, if I was playing first trumpet and there was a real naked, you know, by yourself, beautiful, legit, uh, boom, it's on Malcolm's stand. I'll let him play it. I mean, again, that's where the ego thing goes. You know, that's where a lot of guys get in trouble. Well, shit, I'll play it. Right. Wrong. <laughs> let the guy who that's in his wheelhouse, let him do it. And that's why we all work so well together. And so then also, a lot of the composers will write stuff because, you know, you only, you, you, you walk, you, you come into the session and they've had the music on. The, I never, we never get music ahead of time, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm the great Tom Stevens, you know, who was principal trumpeter in LA Phil, right? He hated working in the studio. You know why? Because he says, he would tell us, he says, oh, God, uh, you guys, he says, this is crazy. You don't know what you're going to play until you open the book. I said, yeah, isn't that great? He said, no, because, the, you know, he knew a year ahead of time what he was going to be playing in all the concerts. That would drive me nuts. If I knew I had to play Petrushka eight months from now, I'd be worried about it now, you know. But that's what we loved. We loved doing that. And Tommy would, it would drive him nuts. I said, Tommy, what do you care? You could play anything they put in front of you, you know. So what Malcolm always played everything. When you listen to Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. Malcolm played everything on his E-flat trumpet and transposed it. I mean, you know, and read better than anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. But for us, then I, then I started, when, when I was doing a lot of uh, um, those kind of things, you know, where they would, they would write it, uh, you know, uh, uh, out of the staff or whatever. Well, number one, they don't want it as a big man trumpet player. They want it as, so I started using my P7 Chucky, a uh, uh, piccolo trumpet, which is a nice big sound, right? And so, you know, we would do that. But the cool thing about that, when you play another instrument, that's called a double, and that's 50% more on top of the bread. So again, we would all come in with B flat, C trumpets, piccolos, uh, and I have a coronet in a car and a flugelhorn, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, they didn't care what instrument we played it on, as long as the music got played. And that was the great thing that Malcolm was the one to start that, that he played, yeah. you know, he played a lot of things on B flat and then he went to C. But then when he found the E flat and I said, Mike, why, why E flat? He says, are you kidding? If I'm going to clam a note, I have to miss it by a fourth, you know? So, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't hire us to make mistakes. Right. They want perfect every time when that red light is on. And right. so we do things and answer your question. We do things you, you you play it on the instrument that you feel the most comfortable with and they're thrilled in the booth. That's the people you got to make happy, you know? Right. Right. Um, what'd you say? 40 years in the studios? Yeah. yeah. Your perception of the evolution of, of orchestration of scoring from when you started to the last time, what could you say about about that. Right now, it's pretty much more legit oriented. I mean, you better know that style to get a great sound, a warm sound, play a C trumpet. I mean, right now, the guys that are, you know, they, 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 there's always guys like Wayne, you know, they're all going to need, you know, guys to do that other kind of thing. But the main sections right now are John Lewis, uh, even the, the new principal trumpet player in the LA Phil. Tom oh, Hooten. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Barry Perkins, another great trumpet player, first trumpet player in the Pacific Symphony, and Dave Washburn. You know, those are the guys that are working because, again, 
when you listen to the soundtracks and everything, there's nothing that's written uh, big bandy anymore, very rarely, you know. And so, yeah, you have to be able to um, have those kind of chops. Again, the most important thing I think any trumpet player out there is, is to be versatile. Play all the styles. If you get, if they put it uh, in the mood on the stand, know the proper way to play it. Or if they do one of the great Jerry Hay things, you know, know how to play those things because that just makes you more valuable to the people who hire you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, you know, one of the cool things uh, in the last uh, few years is symphony orchestras are doing the live score with, you know, the movie broadcast right. over the top. And I've played with uh, Indianapolis Symphony and the Fort Wayne Philharmonic. I've done Harry yeah. Potter and, and one of the Star Wars films playing assistant, but still, you know, you're looking at this and you're like, you have one note, you know, and it might be a high D out of the blue. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm glad I'm not assisting on that chart. You know, I'd leave that to the principal guy, but you know, and you think, okay, this was not meant to be played. This score was not meant to be played in one sitting, right? You guys took however much time was needed. You had well, time yeah, between we do. takes and, yeah. but you know, and I just looked at that and man, sometimes it's a real haul. To get, yes, <laughs> to get through those movies. The Raiders March. Oh, yeah, I played oh. that a few times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you got to, and that's why we, you know, you, you, you try to play it on the horn you play most comfortable. But, man, I'm telling you, uh, I, and God bless Andrew Nauman, who's the owner of Shoki. You know, I played the, the you know, P54, which is a great horn. And, but the P7, there's a little bit fatter sound. It has a more, more bigger sound, and that saved my life. I mean, you know, we could, I don't, I don't care, you know, you, you pick it up and just, you feel comfortable with it, you play it, and I, it's going to make your career a whole lot longer. <laughs> well, and it doesn't sound like a little horn. I mean, you no, know, if you're out there, it it's like, like nobody would ever know. Nobody would ever That's know. true, exactly. Yeah. And in uh, your own mind, you know you got that high D or E coming up. <laughs> Pick a little okay. cake. I got it. Lay it on me, you know. And right. that's all they care about. That's all the guy up there waving his baton. That's he doesn't want to hear a clam out of you. He just yeah. wants you to play it. So, you know, we have to be able to do that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. You know, I remember uh taking a film music class uh during my masters, and you know, you look at you look at movie scores or movies completely different differently, you know. And you go back to even the Hitchcock movies. And I think, was it uh, oh, Bernard Herrmann that scored so. a lot Bernard, of them? Bernard Herrmann, yeah. You know, and you turn the sound down, down on those movies, and there's n they're the most boring thing you could ever <laughs> ever watch, right? Uh, this, all right, so this is, this is my favorite story. And this, this will show you. And I actually sat across the table when we were in negotiation for motion pictures. And I told this story to the heads of, what, of, the, of the music bar on the other table. And this is it. And again, I love Pixar. I love the Pixar movies, they're brilliant. The movie Up, okay. Now at the beginning of that movie, there's a scene where the old man is thinking about his, reminiscing about his wife. And I'm telling you, it's a three and a half minute cue. And at the end of that three and a half minute cue, if you don't have a tear in your eye, right? So anyway, the d director, we were at Warner Brothers, and Pete Doctor got on the stand. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he says, before you play this cue, we're going to put the dialogue in your headphones, and we want you to turn around and look at the screen behind you. And so, because we never hear dialogue. We can see what we're playing to, but we never hear dialogue. So we all, we all, you know, he, we all put headphones on and they played the dialogue and we watched the scene and we thought, wow, that's lovely. Isn't that lovely? Right. And then after lunch, we played the cues. We made a couple take on that cue. And after lunch, Pete came back on the stand. He said, ladies and gentlemen, he says, now I want you to put your headphones on and we're going to play it again and see what your music did to my movie. And we all turned around and we watched it. And at the end of that, 75 grown men and women had tears in their eyes. That's how important music is. Amen. And I, I always thought that was so um, 
that was it. I mean, for me, you know. Well, and you can't do it in uh, in Pro Tools, or well, I mean, they might assemble it there, but you know, you can't use MIDI right. <laughs> to to replicate that either. There, there is something to there is something to, you know, what they do, and that's why you know, that's why the great composers are the great ones because they can yeah. get that come that sound from that orchestra, you know. Um, favorite composer that you've worked with? Uh, I have to say Jerry Goldsmith. Oh. I did, I did 35 uh, movies with Jerry and he just, uh, there was just something special. Of course, you know, John Williams, come on, you know. Well, yes, I, I knew you were going to say that, but. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think really, I, th I, I think Jerry Goldsmith only because he just, he was he was just a great guy to work for, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have a nice long list. I thank God, you know. I love uh, uh, Michael Giacchino has been great. I love what he brought to the music world, you know. Um, but I, I have to say, uh, my favorite would be Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a list somewhere of all the the tune uh, not tunes of all the movies you've played on? Oh yeah, I do. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? What I you know what I do is um, when you go in a session, and I you know I I I'm a fan. That's all I can say. I'm a fan. I'm thrilled to be there. All right. So when we when we go into a session, uh, the copyist is the one that copies all our music. Obviously, they get it from the composer. So the copyists have an, an eleven by fourteen sheet. So every every movie when when you go into a session, this can you see this? This uh, is eleven yeah, yeah. fourteen sheet. Okay, so this actually was from Cars Two. All right. <laughs> so what I would do, and on it, what it says, it says the title of the movie, when we did it, who the composer was, where we did it, all the cues, how many musicians, right? Because this is the list that they have. So I would. Go get that from the copyist. Now, like I said, I worked on 1,300 movies. I have 1,000 of these <laughs> signed. And uh, I, that's why I love Pixar because they would, they would always draw a little picture, yeah. right, yeah. of the <laughs> character. But I would have the composer sign it. I would have the director sign it. And a lot of times, like on, on Cars, Owen Wilson would show up you know, uh, uh, True Lies, uh, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger would show up. So I'd have them sign this, you know. Wow. I've always collected autographs. I have. No matter any kind of job I do, I always go, you know, I figure, why not? This is, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a zillion people out there who wish they were there to get what the things, you know. So, um, so I have about a thousand of these signed. So I know exactly when we recorded it. And uh, that's got to be better than any baseball card collection. Ever. I tell you, for me, that's exactly <laughs> right. I agree. You know, I love it. You know, and a lot of times the stars do show up. You know, like when we were doing uh, Silence, of the, Silence of the Land, uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Hopkins showed up to the session, right? And so he is a huge music fan. He's actually plays piano. He said he has two Bozengos, two Bozengos pianos at his house. He was at every session. So we would, I got him back and he'd come back and was talking to us, you know, and I said, sir, how did you, what kind of scales did you do to become a Hannibal Lecter? And he says, well, he says, truthfully, he says, I watched 50 hours of interviews with mass murderers and I took away one thing. And I said, and now we're all leaning like this. What's the one thing? And he says, when Hannibal Lecter, when you look at me on the screen, he says, the thing I noticed was when you talk to them, they never blink. Now, watch Hannibal Lecter, Silence of the Lamb, during the whole movie when he's on camera. That's how he gets that maniacal kind of look. He never blinks. Isn't wow. that cool? I thought wow. that was cool. And he That's posted, great insight, yeah. Yeah, he posed for pictures with us and, and conducted, you know, conducted the band. I got pictures of him. I always had my camera with me, you know. Um, yeah, it was, it's, uh, so I do have a list. And then, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun to look at. Yeah. You know, well, really what a, 
you know, what a great legacy, first of all, I mean, the, that you've actually played, you've contributed so wonderfully to, uh, and, and, and people still don't know who you are, right? I mean, the general public has no idea. Yeah, I but, mean, yeah. Like I said, I think I've had my name on maybe 50 movies, you know, and that's because yeah. I, mean, I had some solos or whatever. But for me, the other thing is that the, the versa to, in this town especially, there's so many things you can do. You know, like in the 90s, uh, for, uh, for 10 years, we did all the Tiny Toons, Annie Maniacs, Pinky and the Brains, <laughs> all those cartoons. Those, for me, were the greatest. I played first trumpet on those though. Because growing up, I watched the Looney Tunes. And oh, I me too. For those guys play that music. <laughs> and that was Larry Sullivan, who was the first trumpet player on most of those. And so I found, you know, trying to get different ways. And I went through so many harmony mutes to finally find the sound that I actually found that, that I liked on that, you know. But I think I played on like 5,000 cartoons, you know, all those, all those Warner Brothers cartoons, all the Disney cartoons. And I love that because now I'm a grandfather and my grandkids are watching those on TV. And I love mm -hmm. that. My, the, my, 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 the, uh, he's uh, seven, seven years old Lincoln. He just called me the other day. He said, Papa, did you play on The Simpsons? And I said, yeah. I mean, that's, and Danny Elfman wrote the main titles. We did that almost 30 years ago, main titles for The Simpsons, you know, so I played a lot of The Simpsons, but mainly the ones I, I worked on were the Warner Brothers cartoons, you know, and then the Disney cartoons, the big cartoons. And so, yeah, that's, you know, you've got to be versatile. You got to try everything, play everything, you know? Yeah. So my two younger boys have just recently uh, discovered The Simpsons. They started in season one. Right. That's so <laughs> and, cool. And I have to say, you know, uh, I'm kind of enjoying them. I didn't really watch them the first time around, right? But I've sat down and watched with them now. But um, so yeah, now, and most of and on, on the earth, on most of those, uh, for years and years and years, the trumpet section was Gary Grant, mm. and uh, uh, let me think, who else? Uh, I know Gary did a lot of those, but yeah, it's. Uh, it's just fun, yeah. man. It's so yeah. cool, you know. Gary's Gary's another one I'd like to interview at some point. I'm, Gary's a great guy. He really is. Yeah. Great career and a great what a player. And yeah. when you listen to the stuff that that uh, the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire, and and you know all those things that Jerry Hay wrote, those guys ridiculous. Right. right. And Chuck <laughs> Finley, you know, and Chuck is still around, and Chuck is still doing his thing, and he's yeah. amazing, you know. Yeah, I've been uh, trying to get a hold of him too. It's just uh, difficult, you know. So I think my caller ID or my email just, but I'll I'll get to him at some point, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, and Chuck Chuck's great. He's you know, yeah. that's the great thing is that you know, there's so many amazing trumpet players. That's why and, and, and I never I never could understand how anybody say, well, well, you're the best, you know, he's the best. So yeah, no, there's so many players, you know, that how just just be one of them. That's all. How you lucky know? do you think I am doing this and getting to talk to everyone, right? I mean, I think that's, yeah, that this, is way this, cool. <laughs> it has been, because you know, it, again, you're a fan, like I'm a fan. And I love that. That to me is exciting, you know, yeah, yeah. is to hear, to hear these guys. And, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, the longevity part, I think, all just really can boil down to being a, a good guy, you know, being, being somebody that other people want to be around, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's me. I, I, you know, I, uh, I would much rather that, that to me is a bigger compliment to say, Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I work with Rick. He's a good guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you going back to now being vice president of the union. Now right. you're, you know, obviously you're advocating on behalf of the musicians, you know, getting uh, musician credits is huge, but what other things would you like to see happen for musicians? I think, I think uh, the main thing is, is the powers that be, the people that sit across the table and the people who hire us, I really don't think they respect us as much as we need to be respected. You said it yourself. <clears throat> What's a film without music? Nothing. 
But see, they, you know, they have, they have, well, you know, what, you, are you more important than the director? Are you more important than the stars of the movie? Are you more important? Well, we're not asking to be that. We just want to have our name said in the same breath <coughs> as they say. You know, they yeah. don't, my favorite line, and this will give you an idea. This is... 2014, I had just been vice president, just became vice president, <clears throat> and I was at the live TV negotiations. Now, again, live TV, I know live TV. I mean, I played on every live, you know, I, I, uh, uh, American Idol did the first four seasons, and Dancer with the Stars, and blah, 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 and The Tonight Show, and all, you know, every every major uh, uh, um, award shows, you know, I've done it. So I know live TV. So I sat in with that. They, they brought me there as because I can speak on what we go through, what we need and blah, blah, blah. And there was one thing that the people, now you're sitting across the table in this for live TV with three uh, attorneys. One attorney is the number one attorney for ABC the number one attorney for CBS, number one attorney for NBC. Now these are probably two million, two million dollar a year attorneys. Now I thought it was always very interesting because they're sitting across the table from a trumpet player and a president of the Federation is a drummer. And this, you know, it's like, you know, they, they, they don't, they don't respect this. So there was one thing that they kept fighting for in the contract to get taken out. And many years ago in the contract, when the commercials, when they added more commercials, three, four, five commercials in a, in a one hour or two hour program, we would get, the musicians would get, if it was multiple commercials, we would get an extra $10 in our check. $10. So they kept fighting on the other side. No, you guys... We're not going to be, you know, you've got to take that out. You've got to take that out. Uh, and fight, you know, we, uh, and they're digging their heels in. And at one point, one of the people on our side, I think it was John Acosta, who was our president at Local 47, said, come on, guys, you spend more money for bagels than that. And the lady, the head lady at CBS, I mean, ABC said, yeah, but the bagels are important. That's what they think of us. And that was, that was, that, that take that you just took is exactly why, what I did. And I've kept that in my mind every time we go to negotiate is they don't respect what we do. They really don't. And she just didn't say it and laughed. She was serious. Yeah, but the bagels are important. <clears throat> You know, I even see that right now with uh, major symphonies shutting down through all of this. And it's like administration thinks that they're the reason that people show up for concerts. Which amazes me. That to me drives me nuts. <laughs> Are without, you kidding me? Without you guys, they <laughs> yes. have nothing. They right. have to play a record. Yeah. That drives me crazy. Yeah. You know, if that happened, uh, well, it happened with the Indianapolis Symphony. You know, they, they furloughed everybody until who knows when. It's, it's ridiculous. And I wonder how much, yeah, and I wonder how much of the uh, administration is still in the building doing their, yeah, oh, yeah. their thing. They're still getting their money. Oh, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. So, well, you know, I, it's an uphill climb. I mean, this has been this way for centuries, right? <laughs> I mean, musicians. Sad were, but true. Sad but true, you know. And, but, and there's so many people willing to step up and do it for free or for, you know, undercut, undercut us. And it's you know, and, that's, and again, you know, that's, that's the other thing that is, that's hard because, hey, we didn't sit and practice thousands and thousands of hours to go work at McDonald's. So I, you know, I'm in a dichotomy in the fact that I feel bad for some of these musicians who are taking dark dates. We call them cash dates, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, that's how they're going to pay the bills. And if, you know, and so truthfully, and I've said it, uh, uh, I, I, when I'm talking to people across the table, 
you know, like personally, like every month we have uh, um, <clears throat> new members come in for orientation. <clears throat> I have them come into my office, you know, and I have a whole bunch of stuff they can look at and blah, blah, blah. And they talk and BS because as you can tell, I love talking, you know. And so I wanted to talk. And so what I say to them, I said, listen, I'm going to take off my vice president hat and put it on my trumpet player hat. I'm just a musician like you. Now, if you get called to do a cash job, a dark date, I said, and you need that to put food on your table or to pay your bills, I'd say do it, but do it smartly. Don't take a major TV show. <coughs> Don't take, because those people are just trying to screw musicians, period. Don't take a, a, a movie, a, you know, but if it's a friend of yours, come up and say, hey, listen, uh, I mean, I used to do this whole thing for the young composers. I'd go over to their house and I'd play trumpet on their, uh, their reel to try to get them work. I said, no, just buy me lunch. That's it. You know, I, that's the thing that you, we all have to understand is that we are musicians. We need to play our instrument. We're not going to go work a menial job. We need to do this. So yeah. that's my feeling now as the vice president is that unless somebody is really abusing it, we don't do anything against them. Yeah. But what I do tell them, and it drives me nuts, these younger people, is they put it, here I am at, at, at Fox Studios uh, oh. on Facebook and things like that. You know, I tell them, guys, we get Facebook too don't put nobody needs to know and then i tell the guys who are traveling musicians guys who are out with acts okay and which a lot of times those pay really really good money right but don't put it on facebook hey i'm going to be out of town for four months because in this in in los angeles and i think probably anywhere else is that if they find out that you're out of town you know, it's like, hey, why don't you call? Uh, why don't you call Larry? Pa oh no, Larry! Didn't you hear he's on the road with, uh, with whoever? He's going to be out for three months. Don't call him. Call me, right? So if you don't tell anybody, you're going to be out of town. And in Los Angeles, they have a service called Dateline, which the contractors use. That's how they put out the calls to the musicians, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that let's say you're in France with an act standing right next to the Eiffel Tower. And you get your phone rings and it says, hey, Larry, we have, um, there's a, a, a movie call for you next week, a, a double session next Wednesday. And I wanted, it's going to be at Fox Studio. I want to know if you could do it. All right. So you know, you're going to be on the road for another two more months or three months. But you tell the service, let me, let me look at my book. Oh, I already have another call that day. All right. So you turn it down. But to their mind, is oh, okay he's done another call so we'll go under another name they'll tell the leader whoever called you the contractor he had another call so that's good that means you're working but you don't say oh yeah he's in france and he's not going to be back in town for three months right it drives me nuts it right. drives me nuts when these guys <laughs> put on facebook they call what do they call it face bragging that drives me nuts because gig dropping. That's what I, yeah, gig dropping. Gig dropping. You know, Same yeah. thing, you know. It's, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of trumpet players in this town. And if you can't do it, they're going to go to somebody else. All right. But they, your chime will come in and your time will happen. And the main thing is, is when you do get called, you be prepared. I tell these young guys, all right, so let me say, you get called to do a 10 o'clock double session, which means 10 to 1, 2 to 5 at Fox. You've never been to Fox, right? Mm -hmm. So what time do you show up to that job? I'd be there by 9.30 at the latest. Okay. And that's still, a lot of people, some people say, oh, I, at least 15, 20 minutes. I said, no, you're already late. In the contractor's eyes, you're late. He's got 80 people. He sees an empty chair up there. But the other thing is, You've never been to Fox. You don't know where the studio is. <clears throat> you don't know 
So you get there a minimum an hour to an hour and 15 minutes early. And while you get there early, you wait in the parking lot, you see musicians, you follow them to the job. All right, you get to the gig, you get to the studio. You put your horn, you look at the trumpets, you sit back there, put your horn there. Then you go over to the donut and bagel and coffee table and you tell people, hey, I'm so excited. This is my first job. And then they'll say, oh yeah, oh man, I remember my first job. That's so cool. And you, before you play a note, you're meeting people. They're seeing your personality. They're seeing what you're like. Then you go sit at 20 minutes or quarter of, and you start your warm up. Now, especially for brass players, kiss of death in the studios. You never warm up open horn, ever. Everything is always with a practice view. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to hear your warm up. And if you have one of those, you know, virtuosic warm ups, you know, they got like an Al Rizzuti kind of thing, you know, who I played with a lot in, in LA when I first got to town. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah. All the other guys, you do that, they're looking, oh, look at this guy showing off. You're right. the new guy. So you put a mule in it, you play, you just be ready to play. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't get. Mm -hmm. They don't understand how important it is to get to the job early. To the people who hire you, wow, this guy got here an hour ahead of time. He's He cares about the job. It's mm -hmm. all the way you handle yourself. That's the thing that musicians don't understand. You know, you got to make those people and the God, you know, don't, if you did an album, don't take the album up to the contractor or whatever, because that pisses off the other guys sitting around you, you know, think a little bit about being a right. team player and all that. It dry, it's, right. I've right. seen guys who were great guys, great players who, um, didn't handle themselves properly in the studios and they might have maybe might have did a couple jobs three jobs after that hey whatever yeah. happened to so you know right you know uh larry wiseman passed away a while ago i don't know if you ever knew larry but i did um, yes. uh infamous for here in the indianapolis studios for you know it was a 10 o'clock call he'd walk in at 10 oh one <laughs> but he was warmed up and he was ready to go, you know, right. and he, but it just, it always cracked me up that, oh, okay, well, that was kind of the expectation. I know a couple of ones of New York guys who did the same thing, you know, but um, yeah, it just doesn't, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't show any respect to the other players who are all there on time. Yeah. I mean, that's the worst feeling is to show up late on a job. Oh yeah. my God. The worst feeling. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I feel like we could go uh, forever on this. I, I want to respect your time. And, and this is. No, this I'm is cool. I'm, hey, listen, I'm having a ball. Terrific. Well, Great. I wish I had pressed record. I missed all of this. So yeah. far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take two. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> And, you know, I actually did that with uh, uh, Steve Patrick, I think it was. We oh, got about, cool. got about oh, no. five oh. minutes in, and I'm like, Steve, Steve, it, it, for some reason, it shut off. But So we went back and tried to, I mean, <laughs> tried to get it from the beginning again. But um, first time with the Oscars. Uh-huh. Uh, playing lead or yeah. in the section? Yeah. Playing lead. No, playing lead. Yeah, with Bill Conti, yeah. County, yeah. And what was that experience like? I mean, total was, adrenaline the whole time? Total. It was a dream come true. I had a great section. It was uh, the section that uh, that uh, worked with Bill on a few other uh, Oscars. Uh, but the uh, it was Graham Young, Tony Turan, and Warren Looney. So, yeah, I mean, I worked with those guys. And the thing is, is that... You know, the, and you've been in this situation. I know there's a lot of other trouble players out there. Uh, to play on a show that's going to, you're going to, you know, the show is runs three and a half hours, or whatever. The most boring thing is to play fourth trumpet all the time. Never have anything to play. So, again, this was John Audino was the one who said he would pass parts to everybody. Everybody gets a chance to play. Because that made it fun for everybody. Mm -hmm. To the players, wow, 
really respect that they, you know. And so you pass the music out. And so I knew going in, working with Tony and working with Warren and working with Graham Young, that they all had the same attitudes. Like, hey, we're just there to play this gig. I happen to be Bill Conti, like my plane, and he wanted me to play first. That's it. So, um, and I've done that through my whole career. I always pass, I've always, you know, given everybody a chance to uh, to shine a little bit, you know, and, and but I also, you, you know, in that situation, you got to be careful not to put somebody on the spot, mm-hmm. you know, because that would not be cool. But right. all these, these are all great players. My God, these guys have been in the business for a whole lot longer than me. And right. so it's just, it's more out of respect. And so in answer to your question, I felt very comfortable playing. I was excited. The, adre- the adrenaline was, was up. But I knew that this is what I was meant to do. And man, I had nothing. It was, the, it was so much fun. Afterwards is when I said, oh, shit. We were just, and, and, and this is the thing. Every year, the director, the house director would say in your headphones, to all the musicians. Okay, folks, don't forget, you're going live to a billion people because the Oscars is alive to the world. Now, granted, you, you know, if you're not really ready for that, you know, but that didn't hit me until at the end of the show when I said, oh my God, you know, then you're going back, okay, no, I played it, no, I did everything, it was okay, you know. But my other story, favorite story about that live to a billion people is, mm-hmm. Uh, one year, uh, they, uh, the movie um, Mambo Kings, which oh, the, yeah. great Arturo, the great Arturo Sandoval played all the stuff in the thing. Well, one of the songs, Beautiful Maria, was nominated for Best Song, right? And so they hired Placido Domingo to sing it. And Bill Conti came to me, he says, Rick, he says, you know, we need you on stage to play uh, Arturo stuff behind, uh, you know, I said, okay, cool. And so, you know, uh, I rehearsed it a couple of times and Placido was just an uh, un- unbelievable gentleman. And they brought in uh, Sheila E to play conga, right? Mm-hmm. And I got to play my, my uh, uh, a la uh, Arturo stuff, you know. And so uh, we rehearsed, rehearsed, rehearsed. And then the day of the show, uh, I started out in the pit. And I, and I played for about the first hour in the show in the pit. And then they had stage guys come in and they had pulled these ruffle sleeves on my things. So I had that and I went up on stage. And so we're getting ready. It was commercial break, getting ready for the thing. And Placido looks at me, he says, Rick, is it true we're going live to a billion people? And I said, oh, yes, sir. You know, like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. And he says, geez, I'm a little nervous. And as soon as he said that, my knees started to oh, go no, like no. this. Because I thought, oh, shit, this guy's nervous. This is boxing at the window, right? <laughs> but again, once you start playing, everything went away. But that, to me, was a real oh, eye-opener. Like, oh, my God, he's nervous. Why am I not nervous, you know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's, uh, uh, it's, you know, I, and, and, and I just... And I always felt comfortable enough in my plane. I, you know, again, it's, if it was something that, that I, that I knew, you know, that I could possibly clammed it, Wayne's, Wayne's playing third trumpet for me. I'm going to send it over to Wayne. Warren Looney's right there who can play anything, you know. I mean, you just give it to them, you know. That's, that's why I like playing plan first is yeah. that, you know, you could, you could, pass around music and you could pass around something you really don't want to play you know <laughs> they don't have to know that but i knew that you know yeah yeah but i knew it was going to get played and that's yeah. the great you know all right we're gonna we're gonna call back to something towards the beginning and you you okay. mentioned seeing harry james you know when you're in yeah. fifth grade you see harry james did you ever get to hear him live i played with him yeah it was really cool oh, you played I, with him oh yeah in 1982 and 83 the year before he died um, I was married to uh, Louise Berenger, trumpet player. Yeah. And I got her on the band because she was because uh, Harry needed another player. And so they came into town. And so uh, I played a couple concerts with him at the uh, Palladium, and and we did a, a couple uh, gigs in. Uh, but he he was. Uh, 
he was amazing and I told him that story and he 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 was always asking about me and what I did and blah 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 you know and I was thrilled to know that he had heard me you know mm -hmm. but yeah so I did tell him that story and I said I'm sure and he said yes he said there's been a lot of players who have said that you know yeah which is I thought was cool you know that yeah. he influenced that many people you know yeah, you know, the Harry James and the Al Hurt, and oh my gosh, I still love going back to listen to Al Hurt. What a, what yeah. an absolutely, the, the sound was great, but then you start to realize how technically proficient he was on the oh, horn. Amazing. And yeah. you know, Warren Looning, Warren Looning was Jumbo's, that's what everybody called him was Jumbo. Uh, mm -hmm. War, Warren Looning was the only trumpet student Al Hurt ever taught in New Orleans. No kidding. Yeah. Which is which is why Warren was such a a, a freak. I mean, God bless him. He passed uh, I went five years ago, four years ago. But what an amazing mm -hmm. trumpet player! Everybody I've talked to, not one bad word about oh. Warren. I mean, he, everybody said he was just the the nicest, kindest, most considerate, and, and the most you know the most amazing all around trumpet player. There's nothing he could not play. Mm. Nothing. I mean, uh, we were doing, we were doing some movie. Oh, we were doing with Clint Eastwood, and it was a movie. And he said, uh, 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 "I want you uh, to." Uh, uh, he came back to us because he we we had done, I, we did a lot of movies with Clint, you know, and and so he knew Warren and I, and so he went to Warren. He said, "Warren, I heard that you do an, a, a great impression of Louis Armstrong." playing and I want I have this movie coming up and you know and 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 so we we're on the session and he says Warren this is that thing that I wanted you to do a la Louie and Warren and there was a whole you know whole orchestra there and Clint was standing up next to Lenny Niehaus who was the composer mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and Clint says Warren this is that one I want you to sound like Louie and Warren says okay um which 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 year <laughs> Now the orchestra did they laugh? They thought, oh, what an asshole. Yeah. And Clint says, Oh, uh, oh, good question. Yeah, 1941, you know, 30 something. And Warren said, okay. And afterward, I knew why he said that because when you listen to Pops, he sounded different in each yep. decade. And so by Warren say that, it was just secured to Clint that he's got the right guy. And sure enough, he nailed it the first take. Wow. I thought that was cool, though. What year? What year? Well, you know, I, I just interviewed Ricky Riccardi. He's written two books, really, really fine books on Louis Armstrong. And, you know, in, in that interview, I mean, I didn't realize this, but there are there were those uh, those periods, right, the, with the hot fives and the hot sevens and then, you know, the, uh, the more commercial aspect of him and then, the, you know, the much later years. And, you know, you start to listen very differently. To yeah. those and you realize yeah he he evolved well it's just everybody but miles davis evolved right i mean he didn't sound the same at the end as he did that's at the true beginning. Man. you know i mean so. the guys in vegas when i went i went into vegas um they had great stories about louis because louis was uh starring at the sands hotel and the guys in the house band i mean they were uh, uh, they were just so thrilled you know to have him come in but back in those days they, they, um, even though they were the stars of the show, they made them stay in North Las Vegas. They couldn't stay, they couldn't go into the casino. They couldn't do any of this, you know. But my friend, uh, uh, Jerry Munson, who was a trumpet player at the Sands Hotel, he said, he said to Louis, he says, you know, he says, Louis, he says, I know you probably haven't been to Vegas that much, but here it's a very dry climate. And so you're really going to need some, some kind of, uh, you know, lip salve or something to put on your chops, you know, and, and, and you keep from cracking because it gets so dry. It's so dry here. And Louis looked at him and says, no, baby, it's okay. He said, I just have, I'll just have Velma Middleton sit on my face. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, I'm Great gonna tell luck. you. Okay, so Doc Severinsen has been my guest at a couple of conferences I've hosted here in Indianapolis. He's been here at my house for dinner and uh, uh, it was last November. Uh, he, was, he was one of my headliners again. He was my head. Well, Ronnie Rom was too. I had both of them. Right, love, love them both. Doc and is 93, right? 93, and I just talked to him a couple days ago. 
And mm -hmm. in fact, tomorrow night, I'm going to talk to him specifically about Louis Armstrong. Oh, good. Please Stories. give him my love. Okay, please. Absolutely. But when, the last time we were together, we we're at lunch. My wife is there. Uh, my wife fixed an amazing meal and Doc just went nuts over, uh, over what she'd prepared. And uh, Kathy Leach is there. And then my, my department chair at the University of Indianapolis is there. So Doc goes, I got this Louis Armstrong story. You know, he talks about how he and Louis had the same manager for a while and, right. um, and talks about uh, his manager saying, hey, listen, you know, Doc's uh, telling Louis, Doc's down the street. You want to go see the kid tonight? <laughs> so he says, Doc knock, or Louis knocks on the door and he opens the door. Now, I, I can't repeat what you just said, but that it is exactly what you just said. Yes. Oh, for real? Uh, yeah, he said, uh, asked him, how do your chops feel? And Doc says, well, they're kind of loose. And he goes, okay, well, here's what you do. <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I think we all turned beet red, you know, <laughs> during that. It was, but what a great story. But I'm, and so I'm thinking, okay, if there's anybody that can tell a Louis Armstrong story, <laughs> it's, it's going to have to be Doc. Uh, you and Racy is another name oh. I wanted to, wanted to ask about just uh, your, your take on him. And I can already see by the reaction on your face. It's, it's you good. On, you on there again, when you listen to, uh, he, the, the most amazing human being, number one. Mm. Um, he is, uh, and as a, a, a first trumpet player, uh, <clears throat> I mean, he was first trumpet player at MGM. You know, when you listen to uh, uh, April in Paris. No, I mean, uh, oh, God, what's the name of that? Ameri uh, American in Paris? American, American in Paris. That Yuan playing on all those. Mm. Wow. Uh, Yuan, Yuan was something special. I mean, he was a great teacher. It was, he was uh, amazing. Uh, like I said, a uh, human being. Uh, there's only one Yuan Racy. He was the best. I mean, I... I have a million stories, but he is just uh, his sound, his plane, his everything is there. You know, there is nobody better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a lot of people would say there's only one Rick Baptist. You know? Oh, that's so, <laughs> so you know what? I I appreciate everything you've contributed and and still are contributing. Right, advocating now is is absolutely I love, musicians. Yeah. So thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, so I want to do a, a formal uh, goodbye, but then I have a one more question after that, if, if I could. Sure. Um, so Rick, man, <laughs> this has been fantastic. I, I really appreciate the stories. Uh, and and I, you said earlier, you're, what did you say when you visit groups? You know, part of it's lies, right? Yeah, I said what I do is I, I lie about my career and then I talk about the union. Okay, so uh, so I guess we'll have to take everything you just shared with a grain of salt, right? <laughs> exactly, just a very just a pinch. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, thank you. I, I really appreciate. Uh, it was great to meet you. Great to chat with you this afternoon. And and I thank and, you yeah. so much, Lee. This is uh, this was cool. I, I thank you yeah. so much. Really. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to this interview with Rick Baptist, one of the true legends in the trumpet world. Uh, be sure to check out all of the show sponsors and go back to the beginning of the show. Uh, you can go to the uh, notes in the YouTube video and you can go to the webpage, studiohfl.com. There is an excerpt from this interview that uh, can only be heard if you are a Patreon patron. And if you'd like to hear that, be sure to go to patreon.com slash studiohfl and check out how that can happen. Thanks again for listening and stay tuned for more interviews coming up.